Good morning, Lake Church, and glad to come to you by way of technology. Uh, it's an interesting time in which we live. We're looking at the coronavirus, and I know that this week and next Sunday we're going to be suspending our service, but it doesn't mean that the church goes away. Remember that old thing? Here's the church, here's the steeple, open up the door and see all the people. <laughs> well, the church is the people. And so for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be a church without walls, but we're still a church. People are still praying for each other, they're still talking to each other, and we're still hearing the message of, of God's Word. So I think that's going to work out really well for us. So anyway, thanks for being uh, patient with us and helping us kind of get through this thing together. I'm coming to you from our living room. Uh, this is where Debbie and I live. This is our fireplace. I thought I'd do a fireplace chat with you today, rather than just stand up and, and kind of preach like I normally do. This kind of started with FDR. He started in World War II with the fireside chats, and he did over 50 of those things way back when. So I, I think it's a, it's a good model uh, to follow. And so what I want to talk to you about is a little bit about 2 Timothy 1.7. I want that to be kind of our key verse, and I've actually got some other verses I'm talking about today, but I want to remind you of this because I have sent that to you in an email, and basically 2 Timothy 1.7 says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and a sound mind. And so I want you to keep thinking about that. I want you to memorize that verse, and when you start feeling fearful, just realize it's not coming from God. He's not wanting us to be fearful. He wants us to have a sound mind and be full of love and his power, which I think is really important. So I've got my Bible here and I've got my notes and um, I feel like, you know, we're going to have a good time here. I'll talk to you for however long it takes to get through all the material I want to get through. But uh, if you have your Bibles with you, you might want to open up to the book of Philippians. We're going to look at a familiar yet an important passage of scripture as we kind of get into God's word today. Before we do, I'm going to go ahead and pray. Lord, uh, help us now as we open up your word, whatever time of the day or night it is that people are watching this, I really pray, Lord, that your spirit will be with them, help them to understand, help them to learn, help them to apply, help all of us to become closer to you during these challenging times. Help us not to fear, help us to be full of your love and your power. We'll give you thanks in Jesus' name, amen. Philippians chapter 4, we're going to look at a familiar section of scripture starting at verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. Catch that? Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Important section of scripture, so I hope you kind of uh, read that over again several times during these tough times because this is the time when things are tough that we really need to kind of look at God's word and see what he has to say and how it applies to us. So I'm going to talk about that. So I want you to kind of think with me for a minute. Let's assume that you're on a cruise, and many of you have gone on a cruise before, and Debbie and I have too, and one of the things we found interesting on cruises is after you leave the port, Within the first hour or so, one of the things that they do is they have a muster drill. Remember that? Everybody gets together based on the room they're in, and they go to a certain place, and they put on their life jackets, and they sit there, and, and they're told that if something catastrophic happens to the ship, and the ship goes down, that's where you're supposed to meet, and then you get on a, a life raft, and they've got some survival supplies in there, and then I guess you wait to get rescued. Fortunately, our cruise ships have never gone down. That's a good thing, but that's what they do every time you get prepared. So I want to talk to you about this section of scripture, and I want to talk to you about what I call our survival kit. That's what I'm going to call it today. Charlie Brown in uh, Peanuts cartoon I saw not too long ago said this. He said, I've developed a new philosophy. I only dread one day at a time. I thought that was kind of fun. So we're going to talk to you about that survival kit that might be in that in that raft. What, what, would you what, would you, what would you not need in a survival kit if you were on a cruise ship and the ship sunk and you are on a survival raft? What would you not need? And I made a kind of a little list of things I thought of that you wouldn't need. You wouldn't need a DVD player, right? You wouldn't need nail polish. 
Well, some of you might. You know, I mean, you just have to have your nail polish. Um, you wouldn't need a TV remote control. You wouldn't need a USB thumb drive. You probably wouldn't need another HDMI cable. But some of the things you would need is you'd need water and food and a first aid kit. And you'd need to have maybe sunscreen and maybe flares and a whistle and a mirror for signaling. Those are some of the things you would need. So what I'm going to talk about here is, and I'm going to parallel this to the world we live in. We're, we're stranded on a broken world. And so one of the things I want you to get into your thinking, you know, please hear me. God did not cause this virus. Okay? Got that in your thinking? God did not cause this virus. He knows what's going on, but the enemy of our faith created this virus. John 10.10, Jesus is speaking, and he says this. For the thief, that's our enemy, that's Satan, that's Beelzebub, that's Lucifer, that's the devil, whatever word you want to use for him. The thief comes but to kill, to steal, and destroy. But I, Jesus, have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So God wants us to have Zoe life, and the enemy wants us to have the coronavirus and all the other maladies that are in the world today. We're living in a broken world, and so our survival kit is my list from this section of scripture of personal qualities that we need to develop to survive, and therefore our benefit. And again, we're, we're just consider that, you know, we're in a, in a broken world, we're like in a, a raft on an ocean after the, after the ship has gone down, these things will help us to eliminate fear, doubt, and worry from our lives. And I imagine some of you are feeling that way. And you turn on the TV all the time and you can't help but to hear, you know, this is happening and that's happening and this country's on lockdown and this country's on lockdown and a number of you are living in places that are on lockdown. I get it. So, Philippians 4, those scriptures we're going to take a look at. So the first quality I want us to look at, number one, quality number one that we need to develop is be joyful. The scripture says in verse 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Now, Paul's not saying you should rejoice. He's actually commanding the Philippians to rejoice. In fact, Paul uses the word joy or rejoicing 14 times in these four chapters of this book. So it was really important to him. He also, over in the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, he was talking to another church that he'd started. And he said, rejoice always. So it must be important to him. He's telling us that we need to do that. And you can be joyful regardless of circumstances. Okay, it's not the same as being happy necessarily, but you can be joyful, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And again, he's talking here about being joyful, but not just kind of in general. He's saying rejoice in the Lord. And he said it twice. Again, I say rejoice. He used to rejoice twice in the same sentence. Must be important. Now, if, when I rejoice, I start thinking about who God is. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, just really spend some time thinking about, who is God? Who is God? Well, one of the places I like to go to read, and I encourage you to look at it too, is the book of Psalms. Psalms, all these, the psalmists, mostly David, but other psalmists as well, they're writing things about God, you're so wonderful, you're so, you're so special, you know, and you talk, they talk about that. You start reading some of those things. Psalm 91, if you have time today, read Psalm 91. Oh, it's, it's a great psalm, and it talks about how wonderful God is and how he's there with us in, in tough times. Psalm 23, one of our favorite psalms of all times. Read that today, too. Remind yourself of who God is. And remind yourself of the things God has done. The things he's done that you know in the Bible that he's done. He parted the Red Sea. He brought all the children of Israel out and got them, got them away from the Pharaoh and all that. And things God has done in your life. Answers a prayer that you've had. In Psalm 22, we read, God inhabits the praise of his people. So along with being joyful, you can also add praising God. That's a way of being joyful. You know, praising God for, God, you are so wonderful. You created the universe. You listen to my prayers. You do all this stuff for me. You're so, you're so fantastic. Now, joy is not automatic. You'll have to probably, and sometimes, push yourself, particularly during tough times, to praise God for who he is, and have the joy of the Lord. But it will pay dividends, I guarantee you. Happy people in the Lord also is kind of a side benefit. People who are happy or joyful in the Lord also tend to not give offense to others, and they tend not to take offense if other people offend them. They can, and they're not easily angered. A Spurgeon, preacher from years and years and years ago, said this. I kind of like it. The joy of the Lord is the cure for discord. You like that? Anyway, what other things can you do to be joyful? Well, in a practical way, besides you know, rejoicing in the Lord, I encourage you to, to do some things that are going to help you to, to laugh. 
do some things that will help you laugh. If you're a television watcher, watch, watch a comedy show. Uh, put on a favorite movie that just that makes you feel good. Uh, be careful to what you watch. Don't just spend all your time watching the news. It doesn't matter whether it leans to the right or to the left. Don't spend all your time doing that, particularly during this time. You'll just, it, what I find is it increases your fear. That's not necessarily good. You have a hobby that you like? Are you a jigsaw puzzle person? Uh, how about reading a good book? How about reading the good book? And if you're looking for a place to read, how about the uh, book of John? Book of John. I've suspended my discussions about eyewitness, my sermons on eyewitness. I'll do those down the road. They are important. We'll get back to that again. But read the book of John. Read the book of Psalms if you want to just kind of spend time just thinking about God and how wonderful he is. I mentioned that before, so I want to re-mention that. Number two. Number two. So we've got be joyful. Number two is be graceful. Be graceful. Now, the Apostle Paul, in most of his letters that he wrote, he would talk about grace and peace be to you. So we're talking about being graceful. And verse, Philippians 4, verse 5 says this. Let your gentle spirit be known to all. The Lord is near. Now the Greek word for, for gentle spirit means gentleness or patience, forbearance, graciousness, reasonableness, mildness, moderation, considerate. All those are, are, are definitions that they can use out of that one Greek word. But out of the word graceful, we get words like grace, gratitude, and even like, you know, when a lot of times families will say, well, let's say grace. Well, that again is kind of related to the thing of being graceful. Let your gracious gentleness be evident to all. Barclay's translation says, your gracious gentleness be evident to all. Paul says to uh, treat others with gentleness, patience, and graciousness, which includes forgiveness, it includes patience, and being non-judgmental. Treating others with kindness, softness, and self-control. When Debbie and I first came to Lake San Marcos, one of the first clubs we joined was the formal dance club. It was a great club. We put on uh, tuxedos and formal gowns. Uh, well, I wore a tuxedo and Debbie and the gals wore formal gowns. It was a time of uh, civility. It was uh, graciousness. It was uh, very unique in a, in a time in, in our lives. We, we loved that. We thought it was really great. Uh, a time back, you know, when, you, when people had manners, when they opened the door for other people, uh, when they were polite to other people. It seems like we are in a world today where it's assertiveness, bluntness, meanness, and me first. Me first all the time. It's unfortunate. So in the area of graciousness, I'm encouraging you to let the Holy Spirit shape you from the inside out. Paul also tied this to the Lord is near, which I think is a, is a term of accountability. God is near. Uh, God loves his people. God loves all people. We should too. In fact, that's a whole other message. But in the early New Testament church, they changed the world. And they didn't have the Bible like we do. They had the letters that were floating around and they had, maybe they read that, maybe they read one of Paul's letters, maybe they wrote, read John's, all those his were written at the end. And yet they changed the world because they loved one another. And they had seen the risen Jesus, which I'll talk about on Easter. That's coming up. Spoiler alert on Easter, I'm going to talk about the resurrection. <laughs> just, being, uh, just being humorous because, of course, what else would you talk about? Antonyms for this graciousness are harshness, breeds conflict, upset, dislike, drives them away, etc., etc., etc. So we're social creatures, so as we practice graciousness, you're going to find that you have more friends, more people who want to spend time with you, and we as a church know that. We, when we get together on Sundays, and we will again, um, when we get together on Sundays, and many small groups are happening during this time as well, and I encourage you to, to be gracious with one another, to enjoy one another, to realize that if you're in a group of two or three or more, that you're part of our church still. You're, you're acting like the church, and the church gets together in, in different formats, not just Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. But nonetheless, we do better together as a church, and so my encouragement to you is talk to others in the church family who live near you, get on the phone, pray with them, those kinds of things. More to say about that later. Number three, be peaceful. Scripture says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Let me say that again. Do not be anxious about anything. Anxious is a form of fear, and people are anxious about lots of stuff. Right now, I guess there's a big run on, on supplies at Costco and the grocery store, so people are anxious. They're worried. They think it's the end of the world. And it doesn't mean we shouldn't use our sound minds and wash our hands a lot and do other things. But we don't need to be worried. 
We don't need to be anxious. But the reason Paul writes here, the do not be anxious about anything, is he says in every situation to pray about it, to pray and petition. In other words, we're coming before the throne of God. We're praying to him. We're asking him for something. And, 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 don't miss the next word, with thanksgiving. That's a part that we leave out of our prayers a lot. And I've had to learn it myself. Oftentimes we come to God in prayer and it's almost like, okay, it's Christmas time and Santa Claus, here's my list of things I want. And we shouldn't come to him like that. We should realize who he is and what he's done for us and be appreciative. But it says, come before him, and it says, with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. Now, worry is kind of the, the opposite of this third quality, which is peaceful. And worry comes from an old English. I looked it up, which means it came from this old English word, which meant to strangle or choke. <laughs> Do you feel like that sometimes when you're worrying? You feel like, oh my gosh, how am I going to get through this? Worry is the opposite of peace. Worry is non-peace. And this kind of worry it can cause depression, it can cause anxiety, it can cause sickness. And my encouragement to you is, is don't go there. Don't go there. But like, but like little children, we need to trust our Heavenly Father. It sounds easy to say, trust your Heavenly Father. And, but, and for some of you, I know it's difficult. And particularly, it's, I think it's more difficult for people who have come from a dysfunctional family. And there are some out there, a lot of dysfunctional families. Maybe you grew up with one which was dysfunctional. And I'm sorry that you did. But you can still get through that and get over that and get to the point where you trust your Heavenly Father um, just completely and totally. Um, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. When Jesus taught us to pray that prayer, when he taught his followers to pray that prayer, that was revolutionary. He said to call God our Father. In the Old Testament, and even up through until the time Jesus taught that particular prayer to his disciples, they had heard him praying, and they said, teach us to pray. And he said, pray this way, our Father. He taught them to pray, our Father. That's huge. So imagine God as a loving Father who cares about you. And when you talk to him, you're talking to your father. In John 1.12, he says, But as many as did receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believed in his name. Children of God. As a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, as someone who's born again, any of those terms are interchangeable, you're a child of God. So when you go to him in prayer, you're talking to your father, a loving father, regardless of what kind of an earthly father you may have had. It says, and if we do this, in verse 7 of this says, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And in times like this, with the you know, COVID-19 and all the talk about that, and oh my gosh, it's horrible and terrible and pandemic, all these inflammatory words are being used. We need to be able to go to God and basically let him give us that peace the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The Amplified Bible, which you've heard me talk about before, is the Bible for the heart of hearing, says it this way. And the peace of God, that peace which assure, reassures the heart, the peace which transcends all understanding, that peace which stands guard over your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, is yours. I like that. That's powerful. And I want you to realize that this is not just for Jim Brown because I'm the pastor. It's for you too as a child of God. It's yours for the taking. Yours for the asking. He wants you to be peaceful. He wants your hearts and your minds to be guarded. He wants that. So, we've uh, covered so far three points. Be joyful. Be graceful. Be peaceful. Point number four. Be mindful. Be mindful. And here's the, the thought I want you to kind of capture here. Think about what you're thinking about. And I don't know what you're thinking right now. You're thinking, oh, isn't that a nice fireplace that the Browns have? You know, isn't it nice that his shoes match? Okay, well, Debbie did all that, so she got me organized. <laughs> and you could be thinking about a lot of things. You could be thinking about, well, gosh, I wonder when my next doctor appointment is. Don't think about that stuff right now. Put that on the back burner. Think about what you're thinking about. Think about, are you thinking about God? Are you thinking about worry? Are you worrying about your kids or someone else? Here's what it says in verse 8 of chapter 4 of Philippians. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, 
whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Let's look at that list again. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. What are you thinking about? Are you thinking about the newscast you heard this morning or last night? Are you thinking about, you know, your doctor's appointment later in this week? What are you reading? What are you listening to? What are you watching? Book of Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Book of Mark, chapter 4 says in verse 24, Consider carefully what you hear. He continued, With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. Again, consider carefully what you hear. Psalm 1, one of my favorite psalms. It says, Blessed, starts with the word blessed in the King James, King Jim. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But, catch this next part, verse 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Then it goes on in, chapter, in verse 3, it says, He should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, which brings forth its fruit in its season. His leaf shall not wither, and catch this, whatsoever he does shall prosper. So, people read that, and they go, okay, I want to prosper. Well, the key to that is verse 2. And in his law, in God's law, in God's word, he thinks about day and night. Now, obviously, you have to go to work, and obviously, you have to drive a car. Okay, we're not saying that you're 24-7. But in other words, the word of God is, is something they think about. So what are you thinking about? Are you thinking about God's word? Are you thinking about something else? And one of the lost arts that we have here, I think, in this country, and for Christians, is to meditate. Here, verse 2 says, that in his law, he meditates day and night. Meditate really means to ponder, to think about it deeply. To kind of go, what is this really saying? What do I need to do here? Um, it's it, it, basically in Proverbs 4, 20, it talks about it as well. It says, my son, attend to my words. Consent and submit to my sayings. In other words, we need to do what God says. So here in this Philippians section we're looking at, he tells us some things to do. Not because he wants us to be obedient, though we should be. But because he wants us to be whole. He wants us to be healthy in body, mind, and spirit. Finally, point five, develop a can-do, will-do attitude. The last verse of this section, verse nine, says this, the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. This is Paul talking. Practice these things, things we just got through covering. Practice these things and, 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 the God of peace will be with you. Whew. Now, the principles here, are applicable not just to coronavirus days. They're applicable all the time because there's always going to be some crisis. There's always going to be a worry of, you know, terrorists or something. So my encouragement to you is don't be lazy. Uh, like exercise, you just need to go do it. Um, don't look for a pill or something. Can I just take this pill and all of a sudden I'm going to be, I'm going to be strong spiritually? No. It's kind of like lifting weights. You actually have to do it a little bit at a time. You lift a little two pound weight, and then you lift three pounds, and five pounds, and ten pounds, and you eventually get stronger. You can, you can get stronger spiritually. Oh, but Pastor Jim, I'm 93. I don't care. You can still get stronger spiritually. Spend time in the Word. Read over this section of Philippians every, every day for the, between now and next Sunday, for example, it would be a huge start for many of you. So. We're part of the church, whether we're meeting together or not. We're part of the church, whether uh, we're singing songs or not. And we, uh, we're part of the church 24-7. You're still a part of the church. You're cared for. We have everyone broken up into groups. We have kind of ambassadors now at different places who are looking over little parts of the flock, which I think is really going to be great. But we're gonna, for a couple of weeks at least, we're going to be a church without walls. And, we'll be, and you'll be able to see this. Again, you can watch this message over and over again, which I think is going to be very helpful. The President of the United States, President Trump, has called for today, March 15th, to be a day of national prayer because of the amazing stuff that's going on now because of the coronavirus and everything is being shut down, it seems like. It's absolutely amazing. So I want to tell you a couple of things and then I want to pray with us. I want to tell you that we still are concerned about prayer requests and getting your prayers answered if you've got them. So if you've got things going on, then uh, send an email to info at lakechurch.org or call the church phone number at 
471-3802, or send an email to uh, MJ, um, talk to her, or talk to one of your ambassadors as they contact you and say, I've got a prayer request, we'll make, we want to continue to take care of prayer requests, we treat, treat those seriously. Um, something special comes up, if you questions you have, uh, try to get those, those to us so we can answer the questions the best we can and as fast as we can. And I want you to, I, I really hope that you'll read this section of Philippians over. I've mentioned that two or three times now, but read this section of Philippians 4. Philippians is a fantastic book. I taught through it a, a couple of years ago, and it's a, a joy-filled book. But this little section right here, I think, is really important to us. And I just hope that you'll let God just speak to your heart and let go of your fear and just be anxious for nothing. But in everything with prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your love and your care. Thank you for caring for our church, even though we're not meeting together physically. Thank you for uh, this country in which we live. Thank you for the doctors and the nurses who are working and the scientists who are working to find a, a solution for this particular problem. Help us as believers, Lord, to not live in fear. For you've not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of sound mind. Help everyone who's listening to this, whether they're part of our church or, or not, help each of them to cast their care for all of this and more onto you, realizing that you care for us. Lord, thank you for all the provisions you've made for your children. Thank you for the word of God, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Thank you, Father, just, just for who you are. You are the Almighty. You're omniscient and you're everywhere present and you are omnipotent, you're all powerful and you are omnipresent. You know everything. You are with us. You care about us. You know what we need to pray for before we even do. So Lord, thank you for that. Lord, I thank you just for your, uh, just for I guess even the new technology that we're using today to continue to teach and lead folks to get deeper into your word and walk with you day by day. Thank you for the technology. Help us to use it wisely and effectively. And we'll give you thanks and praise in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Bye and God bless.